Yes, thanks for the introduction. Also, I'm very glad you guys have some do some homework and have some background knowledge about this work. Um, I think this talk I will try to have a more like a high level overview about our work and towards this interpretation of deep generating model. And of course, I will touch upon this uh, the the closed form solution for the unsupervised learning. Um, but I think it's good to know the the story before that, you know, how, how we get into this unsupervised learning because we first look into this uh, supervised learning approach uh, to in, for the interpretation. Um, so today uh, my talk uh, is on interpreting deep generative model for interactive um, content creation. So if you're familiar with my work, so um, I have done several works on interpreting the deep neural networks. Uh, so starting from my PhD thesis work that we interpret the neural network trained for scene classification. So we visualize there are a lot of very interesting semantic concepts emerge in the deep generative, uh, in the deep models uh, with the supervision of scene classification. Uh, so this work is more like an extension of my previous work uh, of this network interpretation to generative model to see what can be learned and what concept can emerge inside the deep generative model. Okay, so let's start. Um, so people are excited about the progress of deep generative model. So over the years, so we see many amazing um, generative model. So as you can see, the GAN was first proposed in 2014. Then over the years, many different uh, GAN models have been proposed. The recent big GAN or style GAN V2 can generate the image uh, with different view and uh, different uh, shape and uh, of the image. Um, also, we can synthesize all kinds of these generic um, objects. Also for recent uh, six months, uh, so you can see there is a, a hype on this neural so neural volume uh, rendering. So we can take a uh, dense uh, images of the, the scene or the object, then we can reconstruct uh, the, the con reconstruct the scene. And also the, there is this recent uh, OpenAI DALI work, uh, text to image that uh, can translate uh, nature language into this uh, free form uh, images. So here we have an armchair in the shape of a, of a candle. So before this work, if you just Google avocado chair, you can get nothing, which means this deep generative model really try to be creative. You know, they train on a lot of concepts, then learn how to compose new concept from this existing concept. So that's quite amazing that um, this generative nerves all those concepts. Uh, this also motivate us to look into this generative model and try to see what have been learned inside the deep generative representation. So, you know, here we are looking at uh, um, deep, uh, deep generative representation. So here is a, simply a GAN model trained from this adversary trainings. So, you know, after training, then we have this generator. Basically, it's just a, a deep convolution neural network. Um, so when giving a random vector, um, then this generator will give us an uh, um, image. So, so then we there are two kinds of latent representations. You know, we have the latent unit. So here I mean latent unit that is uh, convolution filters. So we want better understand this the latent um, convolution filters. Uh, then another latent representation is the latent space. The latent space is important because you can see it is a driven force um, for all the things. If we change another latent vector, then the output image will change. So we want to look into both of the latent representation in the deep general representation. Um, so for the first part, so we have this live work that's to visualize and the individual unit. So this is a work um, uh, is an extension from my previous work uh, or, or in my PhD thesis work uh, is a network um, dissection. So we extend the network dissection to the uh, GAN models and they interpret the their individual units. So basically, what we are doing is that we just uh, map the uh, activation of the individual units with uh, uh, the semantic of the output, then we can associate a label to each one of the individual units. Um, of course, not all those units have semantic meanings. We just pick up this uh, unit, uh, have high confidence. And um, after we identify the semantic of the unit, then we can simply treat uh, each individual unit as uh, like a switch. 
like then we can simply turn on and turn off this unit. Then we can manipulate the image. So the demo showing on, on the right, um, it's just uh, the output image. Then user can like brush some regions. Then we can simply like turn on and turn off uh, those units. Then we can like change the content of the image. So it's very pretty cool. You can see user can simply brush some regions, like uh, remove the grass and change the shape of the buildings. Then we can change the patterns. So this is the work that we, we interpret the individual units. So after we do this work, then, um, then we further looking into the latent representation. You know, this latent representation is actually the driven force on, on everything. You know, if we change the latent vector, then the whole image will change. So we want to interpret the latent uh, representation. So here is a, a very simple uh, observation. So here we simply can do some random walk inside the latent space. It's more like a, each time step. We just add some random noise on the original latent vector, then observe what the output change. Um, so you can see here, um, through this ra random walk in the latent space, um, there are all kinds of uh, semantic attributes uh, inside the latent space. You can see the, the bats, the, the views change, and the texture, the, uh, the color of the sheets, and uh, also some sometimes uh, the single bat changing to double bat. So which means this latent space already encodes all kinds of uh, semantic knowledge. Uh, if we can go there and uh, align or identify the, the potential uh, semantic space, then ideally we can control the image generation process. Like then human can interact with the model and change the attributes uh, they want. So that is a uh, motivation behind this. So, so for for this thing understanding, you know, my research uh, is on thing understanding. Um, so to understand the things, there are multiple level of abstractions or multiple level of thing descriptors. So you know, giving this uh, image. Uh, we can have this uh, label um, description, like uh, this is a bad rule, and uh, we know the attributes, the nature, lighting, and the woods and the tides. Um, also, we can have this uh, like uh, um, 2D or 3D descriptors for the things, such as the layout. Then we can have this uh, structure like, um, then that will describe the uh, uh, like 2.5 uh, things for the uh, for for this. And also, we can apply the semantic segmentation. Uh, then we can get the label for each pixel, such as a region of seating, a region of bed and floor. Um, so, so ideally for this given image, there are so many uh, levels of descriptors. Then we want to associate those descriptors with uh, the latent space. Um, also from this uh, result, you can see the descriptor of the scene is actually follow this uh, hierarchical orders. You know, we can first describe the, the layout of the environment. Then we can then include the object inside or the furniture. Then we can finally like the, put the texture and the color uh, inside. So this concept actually follow this uh, uh, hierarchy. Um, so along with my student, um, Yang and Shen, so we're looking into this uh, latent space interpretation. So we propose a, a simple framework uh, that try to identify the causality uh, in the latent space. So basically we can start from this uh, image generation pipeline. Um, then we can apply some of the shelf um, predictors uh, to the output image. You know, computer vision researcher uh, already developed a lot of this uh, predictors. Then we can easily extract this uh, concept from the output image. Um, so then after we have this uh, uh, concept, then we want to go back uh, into the latent space and identify this cause effect relations to identify like if some like sub vector uh, activated, then attribute which kind of attribute will occur or disappear uh, in the image. Um, so, so this framework uh, starting from the latent space. So we first uh, sample a lot of random factor from the latent space. So here each blue dot is a random vector. Uh, after we have this random vector, then we just throw the random vector uh, inside the generator G. Then we can have this uh, image space, you know, just have a lot of synthesized image uh, from the generator. And then we can apply the off the shelf um, predictors. You know, then here we are looking at this, uh, uh, some binary predictors, just uh, indoor uh, lighting condition. Then we can have the predict scores 
for each one of the synthesized image. So here we can treat the predicted scores as a pseudo label for this latent vector. You know, for each the latent vector, we can have a label. Then, then here, then we go back into the latent space and train some linear uh, classifier in the latent space. Um, so it turns out a linear classifier can achieve uh, more than 90% um, classification accuracy uh, for this binary attribute uh, classification, which means uh, in the latent space, a lot of concepts are really quite um, disentangled from each other that we can achieve uh, such high uh, classification accuracy. Then we have another final um, very important step. Uh, here we name it as a counterfactual verification. You know, the previous three steps is more like just the learning or correlation. You know, correlation uh, doesn't indicate the causality. You know, we want to escalate uh, the correlation into causality. Then we have to uh, manipulate the latent space and observe uh, how much the output attributes change. Um, so here we just follow a very simple manipulation. So we, here we simply just add the uh, the long vector of the boundaries on the original latent vector. So you can see here the lambda n is just the, the long vector. Then we just add on the previous latent vector, then, then generate the image, then we apply the off-the-shell predictors and observe how much the attribute change. So we only uh, associate this confident attribute uh, to the latent space. Uh, because in our like dictionary, we have more than 100 uh, attributes. So we can simply sort those attributes uh, based on this uh, uh, verified scores and only identify like top five or top 10 uh, attributes uh, uh, for each model. So after that, um, we have this uh, boundary, then this boundary will be reliable because we already do this verification. Then here we can simply just add some boundaries on the original uh, latent vectors. Then we can gradually um, push the latent vectors across the boundary. Then you can see the, the here is a lighting condition is greatly improved. So the light uh, is uh, turned on. And uh, here is uh, uh, some um, demo video. Um, so for each scene, we have a, a lamp inside then here I just play a magic, then, then just the, the lamp is turned on. And also the global lighting is also changed accordingly. So it's much better than this simple Photoshop result because you know this, uh, the, the global lighting uh, is consistent with this uh, turned on uh, lamp. So in the latent space, not only we can identify this uh, um, indoor lighting, we also can have this cloud, land clouds, uh, vegetation or land vegetation uh, boundaries. So here is a, a more demo. You know, here we have some images. So the background uh, is very blank, so it's not ideal. Then we want to include some cloud inside. So then we simply push the latent codes across a cloudless boundary. Then the cloud just grow out uh, in the sky. Uh, you can see for the second example, there is even very beautiful sunset uh, color uh, projected on the building and on the background. So it's a very realistic uh, manipulation. Uh, so here another one, we have four buildings, then not so much green space, you know, and then we want to add some vegetation inside, then we just push the uh, latent code across a vegetation boundary, then this vegetation, this grass, trees, and just automatically grow out in the scene. And uh, even for the first example, you can see this, uh, this generator is uh, smart enough to put a sidewalk on top of the grass so people can walk around. So you can see from this uh, uh, supervision of image generation, uh, this generator, this gen uh, deep generating model really learn to decompose the concept, then recompose the concept into the scenes. So, so there are a lot of interesting this, uh, semantic knowledge uh, emerge inside the latent space. What we need to do is just go there, uh, identify them, then we can control the whole generation process. So here is an, uh, another very interesting result. You know, one innovation for recent GAN model is, uh, I will see the layer-wise uh, stochasticity. You know, before the style GAN, uh, we have the DC GAN, the PG GAN, the stochasticity, you know, the stochasticity just uh, come, come from the latent vector. You know, we, so we sample the latent vector at the beginning then throw into the generator, then we will have the image. But for the recent style GAN and the style GAN v2 model, they introduced this uh, layer-wise uh, stochasticity. I think that is a very important 
um, contribution. It's more like uh, each layer, they will add some latent vector. So, so in that case, it's more like they introduce some inductive bias to help the model to disentangle the different concept inside the image. Um, so here we just apply our, our method to each latent vector and uh, see like how each layer control different concepts. So here is a very interesting result. So we just show that after we identify the, the, the importance of the concept across the layers and each layer actually control different concept. You know, in our dictionary, we have more than 100 concepts. They are at different levels. Then here is the results on, on, the, on the left. So the horizontal axis is the layer um, depth. So the deeper is closer to the image. Um, so the vertical axis showing you the importance of that concept. Uh, so you can see the early layer in the generator actually control the layout. Um, the middle layers are more like control the object and attributes. Then the later layer that close to the image actually control the color scheme. Um, so it's also correspond to how like human draw the image, like, a, like a, we have a kids, then if they draw the uh, image, then we will first like decide the layout or the view of the scenes, then we will start like putting the object inside, then we'll start colorize or put the texture inside. So it's amazing to see this generator um, actually also learns such um, hierarchies of the visual concepts. So from the pure supervision of image generation. Um, so compared to this uh, like supervised learning, this image generation supervision is actually quite weak. So from this weak supervision, it's already know how to organize the visual concept into this hierarchy. Uh, this is why we, we have the, the paper name, just the semantic hier hierarchy emerges in, in the deep generated representations for syn synthesize. Um, so here is some other result that we can like uh, edit the layout at the uh, first few layers. So the result is not perfect. You can see some um, artifacts inside the scenes, like the lamp is, uh, is disappear, uh, disappearing sometimes. Um, but the result is still very, very interesting because when we train the scan model, the, the, the label or the image we have are just the individual samples download from the web. So we don't have this uh, like nerve training set like uh, for the single thing, we have multiple image with the uh, camera parameters. So in this case, we don't have any like association of the image. So it's more like in order to synthesize the thing, this uh, generator just automatically discover uh, to represent this uh, 3D structure in order to better synthesize the scenes. So that is a, uh, a take, out, take away message of the scenes. So from this super, uh, very simple image generation supervision, the model can, can learn to organize the concept in, in this hierarchy. So here is another result that uh, we even can change the category. You know, the difference between the bedroom and the dining room is actually in the furniture inside. It's more like we can just uh, refurnish the scene. Um, so here is the result that we just uh, manipulate at uh, this intermediate layer. Then we just replace the bed with the uh, table and the chairs. Then, then we can keep the layout as well as uh, uh, lighting. Then we just uh, replace the uh, furniture. So we just manipulate at this uh, intermediate layers. So it shows this intermediate layer codes the objects. Um, so, so we can see from the supervision of image generation. So there are a lot of this uh, emergent uh, structure. Uh, inside the deep representation. This also corresponds to my earlier work uh, that I have this uh, uh, work uh, more than 60 years uh, uh, ago. So it's, uh, the, the title is just uh, like object detector emerge from uh, uh, scene, scene classification. So in that work, we just analyzed the uh, uh, deep neural network trained for scene classification. So we found out um, in this case, so for the scene classification network, uh, there are a lot of individual units. They just uh, like emerge as object detectors. So this individual detects the lamp, detect the face, or trademark windows. Um, this is interesting because uh, for this network uh, training, the label we have just a uh, just the same label. So like this a set of living rules, a set of bedrooms. We don't have any like object supervisions. This object detector more like an emergent uh, detector. Uh, in order to help this network to classify the final scene labels. This is why this uh, semantic label, uh, semantic uh, uh, detectors emerge inside the uh, uh, representation. Um, 
So from my previous work, so you can see this a deep generative model also have this emergent structure, just to have different functions. Um, also, it lead to more interesting uh, applications such as uh, uh, interactive uh, um, interactive uh, uh, content creation. Um, so we further extend this work um, to to this uh, um, steerable dimensions in uh, face scan because uh, the face generation is also a big deal. Like we can we want to manipulate different attributes uh, of the of the face, and so we we just apply the similar pipelines and we want to identify the 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 latent. Uh, vector correspond to the different facial attributes, such as uh, different angle and different age. Um, then we have this uh, uh, last year CVPR and recent TPAMI journal extension. So we propose a framework called uh, Interface Scan uh, in order to uh, bridge the latent space with the facial attribute space. Um, the pipeline is uh, is a similar to the high gun, um, but it's just towards different applications. And we also have some uh, theoretic analysis uh, in the latent space. Um, so so after we identify those uh, facial attributes, then we can do this uh, facial uh, uh, editing, such as uh, this guy wants to make me cooler, and we just uh, throw a glass here, and this guy. Uh, this lady want to make me younger, then we can make make her look younger. And also this lady want a different view of the face, then we can just um, make make her uh, front face. And also sometimes people have weird requirements that make me more man, then we can make, make her more man uh, in this case. Um, so here is a, a demo video showing you this uh, manipulation result. So that is a um, pose. Uh, chain. This result is interesting because it's also when we train the surface generation, we don't have this uh, 3D annotations. So it's more like this face generator just automatically identifies this pose as a very important uh, dimension to in order to synthesize the face in different uh, angles. So you just have this uh, some latent dimension to describe the pose um, of the face. Um, so here is the result. Like we can like change the expression. Uh, yeah, we can make them smell. And here is the change the age. Uh, so you can notice uh, the teeth. It's actually very realistic. You can see the teeth is also uh, aged. Uh, um, so, you know, there is also some uh, related work. So I would like to highlight. So here is a, a, a work uh, from MIT, Philip Isola's group. Uh, on, on the stability of deep generative models. So they also show that in the um, big GAN trained on ImageNet, there are also some um, steerable dimensions inside uh, the model. So here another uh, work from uh, their group that they use uh, this kind of framework to improve the memorability of the image. They show that they, they, if they can have a, like a memorability predictor, then they can use this uh, uh, predictors to help to improve the memorability, like uh, they just zoom in uh, or change the color of the pepper into red, then this whole image will become more memorable. Um, uh, then we move to um, this more recent work that the motivation is that how can we identify the steerable dimension of different model? You know, we have people start training the generative model for all kinds of images. Like we have a generative model trained for cats and the generative model trained for cartoon characters. So, you know, for those kind of um, model, we don't have the off the shelf um, predictors or it's difficult to collect annotations um, for all kinds of images. Then that's lead us to this uh, unsupervised uh, learning of stereo dimensions. So probably you're already familiar uh, with this work. Uh, so we want to um, develop some unsupervised learning approach um, to discover the steerable uh, dimensions. Uh, you know, so then we look into the uh, connection between the latent vector and the first layers activation. You know, before the two, there is some like transform. Uh, transformations uh, inside this alpha uh, in the uh, um, in 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 the, this in this uh, uh, ADA in layers, uh, you know they are doing this transformation like giving this latent vector Z, then then they doing this alpha transform, then 
there is this uh, parameter A and B, uh, then it will change into this uh, intermediate uh, activation. So the observation here is a feature um, difference or the feature residual after editing is actually independent of the latent vectors. Um, so, you know, in, in our previous work, we just follow this uh, linear manipulation. So each time we just add the normal vector uh, of these uh, boundaries, then we just follow this uh, linear manipulation. So the, the, this, we notice then the feature difference after this editing is independent of that, which means um, the feature difference is actually encodes uh, those actual uh, attributes. Um, so in that case, uh, then we develop some objective uh, to maximize the variation of the uh, difference. So we want this uh, feature difference to encode all kinds of uh, attributes. So then we develop this uh, uh, unsupervised learning uh, objective. Uh, so it turns out uh, if we want to maximize this uh, feature difference under some conditions, uh, then it simply become more like uh, solving this eigenvector uh, of this uh, uh, equation. So, so after we solve this, so uh, it can be solved in a closed form uh, solutions. So after we do this, uh, um, uh, calculation, then we can identify the steerable uh, dimensions. Then we, we can have this uh, interface. Then user can can simply like play with the cider bar and change the um, intensity of these different dimensions. Then we can change the uh, different attributes uh, of, this, uh, of the output of the image. So change the layout, a different shape and attributes, right? Um, okay, so I... Um, Finish this part. Then, uh, how much time I left? I, I yeah, and uh, maybe if, if we could go maybe another five minutes. Okay. So so here, you know, the previous work just uh, uh, all done on the on the synthesized images. Ideally, we want to apply all this manipulation to this real image. Then, then we will have this issue of gain inversion. You know, gain inversion is a proper that we giving a real image. We want like uh, uh, calculate the latent code, so invert uh, the the given image um, back into the latent space. So it's more like a, uh, just a solving this uh, optimization problem. You know, just to optimize the latent code, and we want to reconstruct uh, image. Um, but this problem is uh, actually pretty um, challenging because it's, uh, you know the generator is uh, some long linear uh, functions. So if we just simply optimize this latent code, then this is the result we have. So you know in my face and uh, just naive inversion, then we will get the. Um, I mean this uh, the optimization already try its best. You know it can reconstruct my face, my attributes, but it's just different identity. Um, but we have some recent work that uh, further combines this uh, optimization with some encoder method and propose some in-domain inversion. Uh, and then we can reconstruct the face in a more realistic way. Uh, so here, I, I, I don't have time to talk about details. I just uh, show some, um, some demos. So if you're interested, you can take a look at this ECCV paper. So that is uh, uh, called the in-domain GAN inversion. Uh, so we just uh, giving any image. Uh, we develop a method to invert into the latent code. Then we can doing this uh, uh, real image manipulation. So those are all real image. And here is some. Uh, we even can do some like uh, interpolation, like giving two image. We can invert into the latent codes and to do this uh, continuous uh, um, interpolation. Um, so you can see this intermediate result is also a phase, which means our master can um, keep the latent codes in domain, then just uh, make sure this uh, interpolated latent code is still following in the original uh, latent space, and we can have this uh, realistic phase. So with some other result, we can further uh, apply this to to some like a seeing like tower interpolation. So here we compare with a uh, uh, previous semester called the image to style gun. So we show our results can much better than their result because in their image to style gun, they simply just uh, more like overfit each individual image. So their interpolate, interpolated latent codes uh, don't have this uh, manipulation properties. Uh, we also have uh, uh, this uh, very cool um, we call it semantic diffusion. Uh, it's more like a full foreground. We can simply copy and paste and doing this adaptive uh, optimization. Then we can um, like uh, diffuse 
the, the foreground to the background, then you can see the backgrounds just automatically uh, adapted uh, to the foreground. So it's more like a constrained optimization. We just uh, optimize this, then just keep the foreground the same, then the background will adapt it uh, to, the, to the foreground. So you can see this background originally from another image, then, then it will automatically like, change the color also. Um, so here I am. So, so this GAN inversion actually have a lot of application in image processing. So people start treated this GAN inversion as a, like an image prior. So treat it as a deep generative prior for this. You know, the previous GAN inversion loss uh, is simply uh, like this to solve, optimize the Z. But we can rewrite these uh, equations into different um, form depending on this application such as a uh, super resolution then we can have this uh, uh, like down sample this reconstruct image that minimize the distance between the two then this is g just uh, just some pre-trained model and we just treat the g as the uh, image priors uh, for for this task also for this colorization loss so we want like take the rgb to gray uh, for this reconstruct the image then we want to make the cut uh, make the gray version of the image uh, similar to this uh, input image, then we can do this colorization. Also for this in painting, um, and we can just uh, uh, put a mask on this uh, reconstruction loss. So that's why this kind of gang, gang inversion have a lot of uh, applications. So here is a, a work from my group uh, using this inversion for a lot of image um, processing applications such as in painting, colorization, and super resolution. So here another work, uh, ECCB work, that uh, they also extend this uh, deep generative priors for many other uh, applications. Uh, so here another work um, published this year at CVPR, they're doing this uh, um, super resolution or hallucination, you know, this uh, pixelized since you cannot do super resolution, it's more like a hallucination to add this actual information, then they can do this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, generate this high resolution version of the image. Okay, so I would like to uh, stop here. So there are some uh, advertisements uh, to better facilitate the research for uh, for this uh, generative modeling. So we, we open source all our libraries. Uh, we also de develop some um, PyTorch training libraries called the GenForce. Uh, we also provide this uh, pre-trained GAN models so that we, we really need more than 60 plus pre-trained GAN models uh, with Colab, um, Google Colab live demo. So you can interact with the demo to see uh, what result you can have. Uh, also recently, uh, um, my big lab, this uh, MM lab, uh, developed this open um, MM generation. So it's a training pipeline in PyTorch. So you can easily train this uh, 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 style GAN v2 or even, um, I think the big GAN will soon be supported uh, with this pipeline. Um, also, we have this uh, uh, recent survey about this direction, this GAN inversion or this interpretation of deep generating model. Um, also, I would like to thank my students, uh, Yujun and Suryan and Ying Hao uh, on this. Uh, also, we release all the code and papers uh, at uh, this link. So feel free to check it out. Okay, great. So then may generative force be with you. So I'll end up with my this uh, uh, Logan from Star Wars. Um,